They used to do it like the like the virgin answering machine. It's like, hey there, your your conversation is being recorded. Hi there, everyone who uses virgins having a really nice time, and you're a peasant because you don't <laughs> have virgin. Yo, excellent to see you guys, Michael. You got a haircut, I see. Yes, I'm. I'm oh, like, fuck you. I'm notice. ashamed, guys. I'm the only one. I didn't, I'm the only one who didn't notice. <laughs> yeah, that is shameful. Yeah, looks like we're gonna, gonna do this. One, we're gonna do this one without you. Yeah? Only Ooh. people who notice that Michael had a haircut <laughs> in this episode. Ex- exactly. Exactly. You just think about what you've done and come back. Whoa, what are you drinking, Jay? That's some kale juice. It's placenta. <laughs> this might He's drinking sense. his own placenta tonight. <laughs> I actually had a friend growing up who did that. Like we would we would periodically go and look at his placenta in the in the freezer from his home God birth. Damn it. it was it was in an ice cream bucket. So. <laughs> When you when you wanted a scoop of ice cream, sometimes you would open up the placenta and be like, Oh god. Oh. <laughs> oh god. That's a lesson you you need to learn that lesson like fifteen times, you know. You, you open that <laughs> thing like fifteen times for you, like, okay, I know it now. Is that um it was it his own birth or his child child's birth? That was a doorbell. It was his own birth. <laughs> you think I should go get it? Yeah. Okay. So. All right, I'll be right back. Okay. I'm I'm thrilled to find out who it'll be. I think it's a delivery, probably. Rendering who, who was it, Jacob? Do I have two minutes for a good cause? Yeah. <laughs> Although I did say, sorry guys, I'm recording a podcast episode right now. Because <laughs> I never I never have a legitimate excuse to be a bad person and not, you know, I'm like, sorry, I'm recording. And he's like, oh, I can see that you're wearing computer glasses. I was like, yeah, get off my <laughs> fucking property, okay? <laughs> are those are those computer glasses like per se? No, but they have they have a filter in them. So it's it's, really a, nice. it's appropriate uh for today's discussion then what what are what are absolutely y- <laughs> you talking about um this one's easy it's the movie they live by john carpenter and if anyone's ever seen pervert's guide to ideology it's it's the bangingest part of that movie yeah it's, it's I've, very, I've, yeah. i think that it's probably if you want to show someone who the fuck zizek is th- show them that six minute clip of him talking about they live it, yeah but it fucking slaps it's great I think that's the first thing that I ever saw or heard of from him. Mm-hmm. It's also fun. What I like about it is that is I've recently rewatched it because I shared it with my one of my class, like with a class. <laughs> um, just like I was like, everyone in, needs to watch this because, uh, and so I, I had to rewatch it myself. And it's not um, you still learn from it, despite like having you know, if you go on to read Zizek and and, yeah. and his you know the constellation around him, you you still like there's something in that nine. I think it's like yeah, six to nine minutes that like it is the whole turn. It's the whole ideological. It's like it's his yeah. ideological it's analysis. It's all Zizek of it. It's yeah. Perfect Zizekian example, right? Like he's yeah. Yeah. oh we, yeah, this is really of the film. The his discussion of the film perfectly explains. His theory of ideology. Yeah, the film is kind of subs- like subservient to the general point that he's making. Yeah, and but also there's the, the he's the he he lays out the obvious ideological critique, which is that yeah. you know he's able to see the quote unquote truth of of the of the of you know of his experience and the things around him based on this kind of structuralist understanding, and then he does like a Lacanian dialectical turn where it's like in fact actually it's it's not the it's the reality itself. Or rather, ideology itself. There's no outside or inside. Of yeah, it, right? and the, and the fact that that we enjoy our status within the ideological order, and and just to what you were saying, in the way that he, he's able to, like one of the most brilliant things about Jujak is his ability to take these extremely theoretical points and two different audiences explain it in entirely different ways. And this is clearly meant for like mass consumption, 
for the general public. And he's he's breaking down these Lacanian Marxist concepts in a way that's extremely accessible, but is kind of bears this immense theoretical weight as well. Mm-hmm. When I first saw the movie, I thought I I remember sort of like fake putting on and fake taking off glasses. And I was like, you know, the, the denouement, of course, the Lacanian denouement is that, in fact, it's when you're not wearing yeah. the glasses of ideology that, that ideology is actually at its sort of purest, most mm-hmm. operative form. And I remember thinking, oh, fuck, you know, like it's one of those Zizekian and Lacanian thoughts where you're like, well, like I kind of want to crawl into bed and not get out for uh, yeah. a couple of years, you know. Because one would think of in the traditional Marxist sense that, ideology is when the glasses are on it's between you and the world this mm-hmm. screen between you and the world and of course the film in in Zizekian in fashion reverses it what if it's, it's exactly the opposite mm-hmm. precisely what if the opposite, the opposite? <laughs> what, if, what, if, what if the opposite is precisely true yeah yeah um uh so maybe we could just describe the plot simply uh i mean he does a hell of a job in that clip but um Basically, John Nada. I always remember his name because of the way that Zizek says it. John Nada, <laughs> which in Spanish means nothing. Um, the actor in, apparently... In Spanish, it actually means John nothing. <laughs> That's Juan for you, to you. <laughs> Juan nothing. <laughs> yeah, in Spanish, it's Juan nothing. Yeah. Uh, the score John... is Juan nothing. <laughs> <laughs> It's the, the movie starts with like dome, so dome, dumb. dome. It's the uh, John Carpenter makes all the soundtracks to his movies, which is cool. I did not uh, know that until the other day. That is brilliant. It's great. And this one has like, it's like a kind of like synthy working class blues that perfectly suits John Nada. Uh, and it's kind of the only song in the movie that he just repeats it a bunch of times. Um, he's He's getting. He's new in town. He he's looking for work. He arrives at a construction site. Gets a first, job. Actually, but, first he goes to an employment office, which I think is interesting. It is really good. Yeah, because it's actually, immediately set says. within this situation. You know, the sort of the worker, not the dislocated home, worker, the dislocated yeah. worker. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he's faced with you know a very aggressive employment office um, employee who won't help him. So he needs to like get uh, under the table work at a construction site. Um, then finds. Uh, a friend there who leads him to a, a kind of like homeless encampment. Um, and John Nada notices yep. strange happenings in a church across the street. There's some uh, covert uh, uh, revolutionary work going on there. Then the next day he finds uh, in, the, in the wall of the church, he finds a box of sunglasses and he puts one of the pairs of sunglasses on. And he's, well, no, he's, actually he, uh, he puts it back and then, that yeah. night, the camp gets raided by like paramilitary oh, yeah. police uh, and destroyed. And then the next day, he goes and breaks open the box and, uh, or sorry, brings the box with him out into the city and 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 in this alleyway near a bunch of trash cans, he opens it up and puts puts a pair on and suddenly sees in black. What do you think the significance is that not only does he see when he puts them on the kind of underlying message between aver- or under uh, underneath advertising, but the world is also in black and white. Are the aliens themselves black and white? Or is it just because he's looking through the glasses that he can see them the, in black? Yeah, and white? I don't know. The whole world is black and white. Mm, yeah. And people have and people are skeletal, which which I Yeah, they're, they're like these fucked up strange. Cer- certain people are skeletal. Yeah, but they're, it's certain like, people. Yeah. They're like fucked up skeleton aliens. Yeah. All played yeah. by one actor. Really? Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, uh, kind of a kind of a uh, uh, Andy Circus type like once you do that makeup once for one person <laughs> yeah. you just kept it on kept it on <laughs> yeah, the whole exactly. screen process like, yeah yeah johnny makeup was like i'm only doing it once <laughs> one time only okay yeah, that's it he's a very yeah. committed method actor <laughs> <laughs> yeah he sees these fucked up aliens and and it's amazing that how how quickly he turns to violence against these creatures <laughs> the the film was very succinct it's very short and it like the plot there's a lot of like space. There's not much dialogue. Uh, I want to say that that violence seems to be kind of a, it's a, it's a mutual, like it there, oh, there's yeah. just seems to be this sort of like interpersonal tension, like that, that at least in that, that scene that's that Zizek shows, like he's obviously glaring maybe a bit too long or something, but the guy, the, the, the man getting into his car, for example, who's of course wearing a suit, who's meant to, I, I imagine be the sort of diametric opposite of John Nada. 
but but he sort of you know he like gives he glares back at John and and then they, and then John's like you know picks up a yeah. magazine and the guy the guy you know who who runs who's the proprietor sort of is like hey if you're not gonna like buy it's like very antagonistic right I, off the that, my explanation for that is that people were just assholes in the eighties yeah <laughs> everyone was an asshole <laughs> yeah but, so yeah you're right if you're, uh, not, like, he says, if you're not gonna buy that man like take a hike basically and and john looks down and pr- the proprietor is holding a dollar bill that says with with black and white glasses on with the with the ideology critique glasses on it says this is your god Dun, dun, dun. Well, and I, and I think, you know, and what, you know, one the, 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 the vacation sign says obey. Yeah. And, and I yeah. think that like, there's obviously, it's like, it's not like he puts the ideological glasses on and he's being told these sort of mm-hmm. what, what we would assume is the, the core ideological message behind the, you know, the fantasy or the, the imaginary. Mm-hmm. It's not a paradise. You know, it, I, I think that like it, it's black and white, it's colorless uh, people. Some people are alien fucking weird skeletons. I think the, the point here is that, if you were to, if without ideology, or at least this is Zizek's turn at the end, without ideology, there'd be something kind of unbearably, you know, to the proximity between you and, and the sort of the real mm-hmm. of, of any transmission would be just fucking antagonistic and awful, right? Like if we, well, yeah. if we saw every ad, we, that if we saw every ad as a obey or buy this, or this is your God, it's not a very, uh, uh, yeah, nice, it needs, nice time. it needs the supplement. It needs, it needs the overlay of like enjoyment to be successful uh as a way of indoctrinating humanity under the uh the uh supremacy of the aliens yeah all mm-hmm. ideologies require a fantasy to supplement them otherwise it's mm-hmm. unbearable mm-hmm. for sure yeah so he sees he's in a department store and he and like shit go to, suddenly goes wrong and he he gets caught in an alley in an alleyway with some cops and he kills them and he runs off and uh makes his escape and and gets into a car with this woman and, and makes her drive to her home so he can get there. And <laughs> uh, they have a very strange. You, you, you broke up a while well, ago. Am I back? Yeah. Am I back? back? Okay. When, when did it cut out? Anyone else want to try that? When he went to the woman's house. I don't know if it has to be in this kind of detail, okay. but. Well, I don't, know. I don't know. I think I think describing the plot is good. I yeah, mean, I'm sure going, everyone listening, going. everyone yeah. listening has seen it, but it's I think it's good to go through the plot. He, he goes skip over the banger bit of dialogue. The um, I'm here to kick ass and chew bubble gum. And I'm yeah. Bubble gum. <laughs> yeah, it's like such a good line. I realized watching this that John Nada speaks like exclusively in cliches. Yeah, because he's like, a pro wrestler. The actor. Uh huh. Yeah, the actor is a pro wrestler. It's pretty funny. Yeah. So. He ended up using it in some pro wrestling gigs. Oh, he used that line in. Yeah, he used that line. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> brings brings to mind Roland Barthes on uh, on wrestling. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Oh, uh, and then there's actually a great moment where he's like trying to convince this woman what's happening, and they're standing by a window, and something distracts him, and she she pushes him through the window, and he like goes flying down this hill. Uh, he was a perversely horny lady. Did you get yeah, that vibe? Uh, kind of androgynous horny lady but she immediately was like i understand you're in charge i think yeah i think she was trying to like uh convince him that 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 bring him under the spell of her femininity yeah uh he goes flying down this hill he's on the run again and then he and then he meets up with his friend uh what's that actor's name armitage well the character is armitage or the actor's name that's the actor yeah yeah and this is when he tries to convince him to put on the glasses. This is the like bizarre ten minute fight scene. It's like the ira- like like irrationally long fight scene. And the and you just like asks like, what is exactly this guy's resistance to putting on the glasses? I'm giving you a choice. Either put on these glasses or start eating that trash can. Uh, or or rather that it sh- it communicates that the resistance would be so so utterly s- strong, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, he writes. Yeah. He he's like, why? You know, why would? his friend rejects so violently to put on the glasses and then he says like it's it's as if he knows that he's living in a lie and that the truth is is a painful you know sort of traumatic uh confrontation with his yeah. with his you know lived Position. world yeah. with his situation right and so that like that the to don the glasses the, the shattering of that illusion which is fucking painful yeah, and this, this yeah, this and this is what character, you know, Zizek says the paradox we have to accept the extreme violence of liberation that freedom hurts. Yeah, it's it's great. I think this character very much represents like 
like today's dislocated subject. Like mm-hmm. earlier in the movie, he's talking about how he had to move from a different state to to uh, find work to sustain his family, and he hasn't seen them in six months. And he just keep he's just keeping his head down. He doesn't want to create any problems for himself. Um, so he's he's very opposed to to upsetting the the kind of delicate subjected order that he finds himself in. Okay, so okay, so how then do the glasses work? Let's let's go over this one more time. So like as opposed to our traditional notion of what ideology is, ideology would be the glasses. Ideology is the mm-hmm. thing that alters your perception of the world. It's the rose-colored lenses that that like Jake's polarizing lenses that fundamentally change a natural true perception of things by obscuring mm-hmm. them, right? And and so uh in fact it's the opposite why is it the opposite who's got that one why do the glasses why do the glasses how do the glasses not function like that in the in in the movie well then it's interesting in the movie wearing them hurts it gives you migraines that uh he said it feels like a a drill in your head um so you can't wear them for too long uh but why like how do they work um he writes we we all we we read a kind of accompanying essay uh, denial of the liberal the liberal utopia. Uh, it's on lacan.com. Uh, and he writes. So this this is a question as to why it hurts. He said he writes. This is why really seeing it hurts. The key feature here is that we see the true nature of things. We need the glasses. It is not that we should put or take them off to see the re- uh, reality as it directly is. We are naturally in ideology. Our natural immediate sight is already ideological. So like our spontaneous relationships to the world is always already via the dominant symbolic order we can't like we are already yeah. as so subjects when, interpolated yeah. into the system exactly so when john puts the glasses on he sees things apparently for how they truly are but there's still a further twist to be added there after that but i think the, the way that's distinguished from this view that ideology is the obscuring of the of the natural perception of the world mm-hmm. the movie Display, you know, acts it out in 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 the in the way that that the glasses pierce through the semblance of uh, natural, undisturbed, uh, mm. true, uh, unaltered reality perception of reality that people have when they're not wearing glasses. So the glasses see through that, and so this is what Zizek always talks about with with ideology. Like when you think you're outside ideology, that is when you're non-duped. You err, right? You are. You are fully in the midst of ideology when you think that you, that you, you know, just in the way that you spontaneously observe things to be yeah. outside of it. And, one, and that, would even that think- is like, I mean, when you, when you try to speak to someone, I'm sure everyone has encountered this about like, I mean, this is what, what Hegel is talking about in sense, in the sense certainty chapter in, in the phenomenology of spirit, right? Like he's like, okay, how do we know the world? You know, someone would say, okay, well, it's, it's through our, it's through our sensual, sensuous perception of the world. The, I see something. It's true. I have access to it through my immediate sensory observation of it. And Hegel very quickly dismisses this, right, by saying, like, well, the only way that you have access to it is through is through language. And language is language can only like we the only way that we can gain access to the most immediate is by using the universal medium of language. You can't access anything in its absolute particularity. You can only universalize it. So like I think the same thing is going on here. You don't have, like, you don't have the immediate. You have the reference to how you observe something through the structure of meaning that that determines the thing that you're at, that you're seeing and the way that you're seeing it. Yeah, your ability to see it at all. I also think there's a there's an interesting uh, nuance that John Carpenter is adding here. Uh, whereas, like, one would think the traditional Marxist position would be by merit of the fact that. John Nada, John Nada, and Armitage are lower class. They would have a kind of privileged position mm-hmm. um, in 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 the form of resistance and critique. Um, but uh, and this is kind of Zizek's continuous point with ideology is it's like the the issue is that it pervades all levels of class. And this is this is why Marxists you know aren't too hot on Zizek is like like even there's no you're not given a kind of preferential ability to see things necess- clear necessarily by merit of like you know 
what well, class cl- class yeah. itself can't be essentialized like any yeah. like any other identity right it's yeah. not it's it's not some em- 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 emancipatory naturally an emancipatory position yeah but, but, not, but, it, but it mind you like, that is where the film kind of ends but it's not it's only through the kind of radical uh uh intervention of the classes it's not because they were who they were in the first place yeah well it's like it's like the because he's nothing of, he's it's like the form of ideology nothing. not the content of ideology right yeah. There you go. Yeah. John Nada That's is nothing right. like that feature of ideology is universal. So there's no ideology that doesn't assert itself by means of delimiting itself from another mere ideology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because so DJ like, actually mentions this. Ideology is all ideology is ideology of ideology. So an mm-hmm. individual person subjected to ideology can't say to himself, I'm in ideology. He always requires another doxa in order to distinguish his true position from it. So mm. when you're taking mm. off the glasses for John Nada, he doesn't realize that he is within ideology. Right. His experience mm. is put on the glasses. You're seeing beneath the surface, you're seeing the subliminal messages, blah, blah, blah. But in fact, it's his return when he takes the glasses off that ideology is obscure to him again. But, but the, but the realization persists. Even when he has the glasses off, he's still um, the impact, the kind of impact of seeing the, um, the critique via the glasses remains. See, I don't know how true that is because the aliens arrive long after the advent of neoliberal capitalism. I, I actually think that the movie, the money, they mobilize the advertising. See, I think I, the movie is kind of saying they they are neoliberal capitalism not not that not capitalism but maybe like john carpenter's self-explanation for the movie is that it's a critique of uh yuppies reaganism and capitalism so like we can you know equate the rise of neoliberalism roughly maybe a bit earlier but with the reagan era and like kind of the change in the way that the the kind of new figure of the yuppie uh represented like obsessed with like physical fitness and like uh having all your enjoyments and delights and neat little posi- like packages and uh well the the aliens in the movie are interesting though to like considering this like the way like the role that the aliens play because i think if you're doing ideology critique in the Zizekian sense the film wouldn't need the aliens right like in some mm-hmm. sense the aliens function as like an explanation of a cause for the suffering of the people who live under the capitalist order which very obviously is a critique of the capitalist order um so like on that front you could say that it falls short of its you know leftist bona fides but like he does point out how aliens are a trope in in hollywood like going all the way back Mm -hmm. to the invasion of the body snatchers so like you're also dealing here with a a signifier a, a figure of right like the the thing from outer space, she she calls it, you know, often like like the alien, the 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 disruption that disturbs the organic social order, yeah. right? Um, so I think that the like the film uses the aliens actually quite intelligent mm-hmm. t- intelligently, as we were just talking, as I just mentioned, like as a figure of ideology, like in the same way that the that the that the figure of the Jew for the anti semite um, explains the, explains how ideology works, like. I think you can say that the aliens in the film show how the figure of something works in the ideological edifice to paper over the contradiction at the heart of the social order or the contradiction of the cap of capitalist society. So like, although Mm -hmm. the aliens uh, do play that role in the film, like through our actual, like if we're learning the way that the film like explains ideology, you can say that the aliens also explain how the figure of something works to works to like not go far enough in interpreting uh-huh. uh like the you know the 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 the, the, the true structure of, of the true structure yeah, yeah. but that i will say, yeah. yeah no it makes sense it's that's great but i i also think that under the guise of that trope of the kind of classic invasion story the the, the aliens themselves are are different than we normally see in these types of movies they're not they don't come in in this kind of big show force they they use uh the structure of desire to their own ends um 
via this this system of indoctrinating um, uh, humans into their into their scheme rather than like co- overtly subjecting everyone. So it's there's something I was just going to comment on the role of the aliens and and like tie it back to what Will was saying about about the kind of the what I think is an ideological position that we would have an unmediated um, uh, relationship with the world through our senses. Mm-hmm. It's like it, the figure here almost seems to present the fallacy that we could disaggregate our you know our our experience from or rather our sensory experience from our ideological perception yeah and like embed- embeddedness and i think that the ideological position that i remember coming sort of first in contention with was when i was re- encountering structuralism and it, it's funny will that you mentioned the the passage from phenomenology because it sounds basically like you know the, the pre the preconceived structuralist notion right of mm-hmm. Of that, that everything in a certain way is always universalized by language, which mediates our very experience. I remember classmates of mine resisting very intensely the idea that we couldn't have an experience with th- that wasn't prior to language. And I think that that ideological position is really a always interesting to think about, like this this kind of demand and need, almost panicked, right? This paranoic, like, well, no, they're like not everything is linguistic, but. It, what this movie does, what, what what they live does, it it kind of proposes that by some, by way of some like crazy extraterrestrial intervention, we can postulate the inside outside, you know, by mm-hmm. way of these glasses, violently sort of play with the line of I, you know, ide- in and out of ideology. But I think what will your point is why it where it fails is that I think from a Zizekian perspective, there is no way in which we could, you know kind of like toggle with that that line in the same way that the glasses allows John Nada to do. It's like you, and it's back to what you said as well, Michael, it's that there's no way that you can kind of, um, every ideology is the ideology of ideology, of ideology, right? Is that something you said that, right? right? Like to even posture like that, yeah. that there, that there isn't out like that, like to be, I know this ideology, you know, or I'm part of this ideology or is to assume the objective position that you cannot right right but no don't ex- don't don't you think that it's important though that Zizek calls them ideologically ideological critique glasses so he's equating what john nada is doing with the mode of critique and i agree with you that there is no exact you know there isn't an outside and uh in the way that maybe the film does but uh there is a sense in which uh Zizek is saying that the way where it is successful is how you can use that as a lesson in what in how to understand the critique of it, of capitalism ideology, but see you. Like, I'll see you next time. Yeah, <laughs> drop in any time. Yeah. Love you guys. Love you. God bless. Uh, but maybe just to to continue like where the movie goes because I think it it has to do with what we're talking about right now. Like once he once he fights with his friend, he convinces his friend to put on the to put on the glasses. Then they go out and join the resistance, and the film kind of like. I feel like Carpenter didn't exactly know how to end it, but they, they end in this film or in this TV station and they destroy a uh, satellite dish that, that ends this mind numbing transmission that is holding the whole human race subservient to this, uh, to like seeing the aliens as humans. And then when it gets turned off, suddenly all the aliens are immediately apparent to everyone. And it ends this kind of joke. This woman's like having sex with an alien. And uh, it's pretty funny, but uh, in the TV station, they encounter their friend who from the um, homeless encampment. And he's been, he's one of these humans that's been convinced to join the aliens. So I feel like, and he says, I wrote down what he says. He says, he's trying, he's like justifying the whole scheme to them. He says, it's business. That's all it is. You don't understand. There are no countries anymore. There are no good guys. They own everything. They're going to let us have a good if we leave them alone. What's the threat? We all sell out any uh, anyway. So I think like rather than it just being this the story between like inside outside or like aliens versus humans, there's a bit of more of a complicated relationship between seeing and not seeing and like like who's involved in this general uh, plot because there there are many humans who are on board and participating in it. And I think that's kind of a like what car- that's 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 the functioning of capital. It's like w- what he's saying is like there are no good guys. It's not a threat. Which is what we do anyway. That's what that's the businessman who who goes home and says 
oh, you know, what I do in, in, in venture capital and, and taking over business takeovers and closing, that's not really who I am. Who I am is these other things that I have and these interests, but uh, that kind of disavowal is, is crucial to the functioning of, of capitalism anyway. I think it's also interesting that Nada, you're introduced to Nada as this lone individual who carries his own tools, goes to the working site and uh, doesn't really want to take the job because he has to get a union ticket. Mm -hmm. And you see that kind of independence slowly change when he has to be involved in the social ties that allow him to um, resist the aliens. Yeah, yeah. Because there's something to that. Because, like, one of the popular interpretations of They Live is that it's an anti-Zionist allegory. Mm -hmm. So, like, in 2017, Carpenter had to go to Twitter to defend it because it became, like, a a meme muse for online neo-Nazis. So their thing was, like, yeah, Carpenter admires noted anti-Semite H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, The movie relatively quickly disappeared at the box office. From alleged higher power. The the, the issue the issue with um calling H.P. Lovecraft a noted anti semite is that basically everyone in the nineteen twenties was a noted anti semite. <laughs> so Piper himself, interestingly, um, tweeted that they live was a documentary, which the neo Nazis interpreted as an admission of the film's secret purpose that could have led directly to Piper's untimely death. Two years later. Pi- who's Piper? Who's Piper? Uh, yeah. The actor who plays John Nardo. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sure it wasn't the steroids because he was a... Uh... <laughs> well, no, he was obviously a buffoon because he... Yeah. I listened to the director's commentary when I went to bed the other day and he was saying that the film told the truth and this kind of thing is happening. Just look at the Bronzewick affair. So I found out what the Bronzewick affair is. Turns out it's a mockumentary satirizing consumerism that Piper evidently misrecognizes as a documentary. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, yeah, well, in that in that tweet that you referenced, John Carpenter wrote, "They live is about yuppies and unrestrained capitalism. It has nothing to do with Jewish control of the Jewish control of the world, which is slander and a lie." Uh, but yeah. like the the film definitely leaves its, leaves itself open to many different interpretations. Uh, like you can see, you can see. I think how it that, could be. I think that comes out of thinking that that the point of the film is to determine the bad actors in the form yeah. of the aliens. Just like mm-hmm. the, just like the how we were talking a few weeks ago with Fabio. How how like mm-hmm. the conspiracy finds the paranoid conspiracy finds the responsible bad actors, uh, pulling the strings. The, the, yeah. the, the naughty guys and, the naughty boys and it, like, ignores, it ignores yeah it ignores it, it ignores what the guy says to John Nada uh, right. it's business that's all like yeah the right. true message of the film is it's just business there aren't good guys there's no countries like yeah, we're all involved yeah, and, it, and it also ignores the what Zizek is you know the thread he's pulling out in the movie which is the capacity of the ideological critique to uh invert the the in, invert the the causality of uh ideology being something that you put on versus something that you exist in as a, like a fish in water mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. Yeah. and and people who people who do that are like the people who in the world of the movie see the aliens uh like or actually who would that be though like they're the people that would see who would watch the movie I mean, so anyone is apt to do this because Zizek's critique is actually very, you know, very, it's a very like finely tuned critique, but like watch the movie and say, oh, it's a movie about, about aliens, about bad guys who are aliens who are yeah. ruining the world. Yeah. And then it's like, it's also like the way that the movie ends as like, like blowing up the, the TV station antenna or whatever. Like that does seem a little bit silly at this point. Like that the, that the, the TV is is the evil thing. I mean, it just feels kind of like an old fashioned way of thinking about like the problems in the world that like like all oh, the uh-huh. boob tube. Everyone's watching the boob tube, you know. Everyone's yeah. riding their brain on the boob tube. Uh, whereas Zizek, like we were talking about taste off off the air, like Zizek finds in this pretty discounted, you know, like sub, uh, like like not you know like not exactly important in John Carpenter's Uber from people who like don't really know the films that he made. Like mm-hmm. uh, he sees in this movie a way to explain 
interpretation of ideology, right? Critique of ideology. Mm -hmm. Good point. That is, you know, the enemy or the, the bad guy in the movie, like, is capitalism. It's the aliens. It's the aliens in the way that the, like, the figure of the alien, the figure of X operates to obscure the antagonism. And I, and I think yeah. it's telling that in Zizek's um, account of the movie, he, he, he kind of stops halfway through. He doesn't really bother telling the rest of the movie because to him, it doesn't really seem all that important. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think we're nearing a, nearing a, yeah. Was there anything else we want to talk about? Um, I, well, as an aside, I love what Zizek wrote about taste in there because it's something that I've been trying to formulate for a while. This kind of general like annoyance I have is like, you know, someone who cares about like, you know, good film or, or good literature or good music, but is is also generally annoyed at people who uh, only consume that sort of thing. Like, you know, eat, like not cutting it, not cutting it at all and and having general kind of judgment of of anything seem to be not uh, codified. And uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, things that aren't in good taste, right? Yeah, Jesus Christ. Uh, the only proof of taste is that one knows how to occasionally like things which do not meet the criteria of high taste. The one who strictly follows high taste thereby displays his lack of taste. Like because you're not you're not really choosing anything for yourself. You're merely abiding by what you should like. I think that's a very good way of putting it. As this is, as, uh, as it says in the I Ching, you become <laughs> ponderous and one sided. <laughs> well, that is that is uh, undialectical. Good way to put it. And I think like if you were if you were if Zizek were to be one of those people, an acad an academic who who will only talk about like you know the the, the highest literature, the highest film, mm -hmm. he would never bother mentioning this film. No. And I think no. we would be worse off for it. Yeah, because he does a similar thing with Jaws, right? That mm -hmm. the shark stands in as a well, the shark functions as a master signifier, and then you have this um array of interpretations that the shark um functions as mm -hmm. the idea being that if the, the master signifier is a kind of like an empty placeholder that can produce a point de capitom yeah that has yeah, all yeah. of those ideological interpretations in its coordinates mm -hmm. right but like at the same time the the thing that you encounter like the art object whatever uh depends like it depends upon its interpretation like in, in yeah. the way that it's worthwhile to you it's not just oh this is good or this is bad or this is uh acceptable or this is unacceptable it's like what can be made out of this is the is the question for the critique of ideology i think like how can this be how can this be used to explain the way that even taste functions or like or how your perception of it functions, right? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, for example, like this film was meant to, it was it was of a very historical context. But the fact that it's it seems not only truer today, but it actually be kind of manifest in some way these days, you know, shows shows that it is it has the capacity to be considered like a significant work of art. It's not it's not just a kind of dumb throwaway movie. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Maybe one final thing we can talk about in the article that we read is um, tolerance and intolerance. I find this really like a really interesting notion. Like, um, who would be against tolerance? Why would you be against tolerance? Mm -hmm. You should want to be tolerant. Tolerance is good. Tolerance is yeah. just. Tolerance it's is also how like we should say, live in our society. Why would you want to be? Why would you not want to be anti-racist, for instance? Exactly. That's a more like contemporary version of it. Yeah. 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 Um, let me find this quote here because it's so good. So where is ideology? Zizek says, when we are dealing with a problem which is undoubtedly a real one, the ideological designation perception introduces its invisible mystification. Say, say tolerance designates a real problem. I am as a rule asked, Zizek is speaking, you know, as he, this is autobiographical here. I am as a rule asked when I pose it, um, but how can you be for intolerance towards foreigners, for anti-feminism, for homophobia? Therein resides the catch. Of course, I'm not against it. But what I'm against is the perception of racism as a problem of tolerance. Why are so many problems today perceived as problems of intolerance rather than problems of inequality, exploitation, or injustice? Yeah, it's, it's, why is, that's, the, proposed that's remedy, why is yeah. the proposed remedy tolerance rather than emancipation, political struggle, even armed struggle? 
the cause of this. Yeah. So like that's the because, crucial idea. That- yeah. Co- tolerance allows you to simply just accept the system as it is to tolerate it. Exactly. It's yeah. to, it yeah. to change your perspective rather than a change in the, in the structure itself. And the notion of intolerance totally orients your attention to people that are like you, but basically just disagree with you. Right. Versus turning your ire towards, you know, towards the, the, the structures that, that, that determine, you know, mm-hmm. such, like these, these placements in you know, the social order, like basically it means depoliticizing. Yeah. And that, and that's the kind of kernel of ideology, like the moment where you think you're kind of stepping outside with a kind of reasonable solution. One that does, one that doesn't appear to kind of be, be continuing the, the, uh, normal flow of things is when you're the most within ideology. Exactly. Like tolerance, tolerance is not emancipation. It is not political struggle. And, you know, like, and sometimes these, these things demand, some some form of violence right we're going to talk about that i think coming up or like it demands it demands some yeah. kind of actual struggle right and yeah i was watching this other thing with zizek it's a uh, interview he did it's a it's a rare video actually zizek is himself interviewing yanis varifakis which hmm. is kind of cool that's cool um but he said he says uh he quotes alanka zupancic and it's uh michael it's um, what you call the the uh slovenian palindrome Right. He says, uh, he says, not politics of emancipation, but emancipation of politics. Basically, what he's saying is that we need a more engaged politics. Right. Like the, the way of relating with it uh, in terms of tolerance is uh, what we said before is it's depoliticized. Right. So it's like the emancipation of politics would be the emancipation from that depoliticization of of the political sphere. Right. And it's it's thinking about um, don't. I mean, tolerance, intolerance is like, you know, some people accept the aliens, some people don't like the aliens, right? Yeah. Though, I, if I might defend the slapdash ending of the movie towards what you're saying, like, I feel like the liberal approach to the end of that movie would be to try and get everyone sunglasses, right? Whereas this small revolutionary group takes up our arm, arm struggle to try and destroy the very symbolic structure which is emanating from the uh satellite tower yeah that's true okay that's a good point but i don't know if it would be to get everyone i think i'm not i'm not really convinced but i think i think there's something there (laughs) because every because it's like the way that the film is saying that we exist in in you know today's today's capitalist world is through uh our through our search for pleasure and our enjoyment right so it'd probably be to you know stash them away or destroy the destroy the sunglasses to refuse to put them on um no but i mean like if 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 tolerance is seen as like oh yeah you're right i see what you mean yeah Yeah. because Uh, like you know tolerance has everything to do with intolerance right it's like it in in the in the duality of in like the other side of the coin of tolerance is intolerance right and if you proceed to uh to critique the social order through this lens you get through the lens of tolerance you get intolerance and this is what Zizek says is like the response of extremism is a response not to the the dense web of mores and cultural practices of society rather it's to the through the liberal pursuit of tolerance that tries to sort of swallow up all of the uh, all of the other things that it encounters and and extremism mm-hmm. sort of rejects that. Um, anyway, I think uh, I think that about sums it up. I think it does. I think I think yeah. I think we reached the end maybe a few minutes ago. But um, yeah, it's a uh, fuck. It's a great movie. Um, yeah, recommend John Carpenter. So fucking good. Yeah, I don't know if you could do as good a reading like Zizekian reading of uh, the thing. I mean, you probably could. In fact, you definitely could. Uh, but man, I think the thing still stands alone for me as. Yeah, it's it's yeah. his best movie. It's so good. Special effects alone, and for the for those Zora, still um, pursuing the spooky the spooky spirit of the season. Uh, let's um, is it let's, not fun at all? Let's officially sign out just no. so we can. But I'm gonna, yeah. I want to smoke a cigarette. But. Jack and so on. Michael, Will, Peter, Jake was here for a bit. Yeah. Good night. Good morning. Bye-bye. And so on, and so on. And so on, and so on.
Come on. 